I would like to invite uh, Sheikh Imran uh, Nazar Hussein to give his uh, speech today. Inshallah. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi al-lazina astafa khususan ala afdalihim wa khatamin nabiyyin muhammadin al-amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba' Brother Chairman, uh, students, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh One uh, minor correction before we commence uh, we're not speaking really on the Quran and the end of time but rather the Quran and the end time the difference is <laughs> the difference between the two the end time and the end of time the end of time is when the world as we know it will come to an end and that will witness the resurrection but the end time is the last stage of history which culminates with the end of history and with the guarantee the truth will prevail over all rivals regardless of what the Security Council of the United Nations may want to do. How much time will elapse between the end of history and the end of the world or the end of time? Only a lot of us. So we are not concerned tonight with the end of time. Rather we are concerned with the end of time. This is also known as the sa or the hour, the last hour. And uh, there are many signs by which we would know that we are now living in the last stage of history. These are known as the Alamatu Sa'a. And uh, the most dramatic of all uh, these signs that were given to us came at the very end of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had perform the last pilgrimage, the Hajj and uh, he made his way back to Medina and there were just about 81 days left in his blessed life when two very 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 important things occurred number one of course was the last revelation of the Quran on the subject of riba. But we're concerned tonight with the second event. And that is when the angel, Jibra'il alayhi salam, appeared in the form of a human being and came into the masjid in front of everybody and asked those five questions. The first, the second, and the third form one part. And the fourth and the fifth form the second part. And the first part is integrately linked to the second part. You have to discover that linkage, of course. What is Islam and what is Iman and what is Al Ihsan? Uh, the growth, the growth of truth. The growth of truth from acceptance with the lips to penetration 
in the heart. To that stage where the heart can now see, but otherwise cannot be seen. So that you now can see with two eyes the external and the internal. And one of the signs of the last age is that most people are going to be one-eyed, seeing only with the external eye and internally blind, like you know who, that gentleman out there with a PhD in deception, Dajjal, Al-Masih Dajjal. And this growth, until you reach that stage, where you can see with both eyes and therefore you can access two oceans of knowledge two oceans of knowledge and try to locate yourself at that spot where you can integrate two oceans of knowledge together harmoniously Majma'ul Bahrain is necessary for moving to stage two namely question number four what when would the last hour come, the Sa'ah? And he replied, Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, that the one who is being questioned has no more knowledge than the one who is questioning. And then came the last question, what are the signs of the last day? And any one of you who has ever ventured into a place called KLCC, KLCC would immediately recognize one of them. He said that the that, that naked, barefooted shepherd, none of you here is from Dubai, is he? No. The naked, barefooted shepherds, meaning those who have the intellectual acumen of naked, barefooted shepherds, would compete with each other in the construction of high-rise buildings. So when you see the high-rise buildings, when you see the competition, when you see the acceptance of this measuring rod of progress, that you measure progress on the basis of the height of buildings, <laughs> you know that you're living in Akhirul Zaman. You don't need spectacles really to see the tall buildings. And when you are living in Akhirul Zaman, if you can see if you can see with only one eye, you lost. You lost. The only one who can survive Akhirul Zaman when you see the tall buildings up there in KLCC are those who have penetrated the truth to such an extent that it has enveloped the heart. And Allah watches the heart. وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَحُولُ بَيْنَ الْمَرِّ وَقَلْبِ That Allah hovers between a man and his heart. And that the truth has so penetrated the heart that something called Noor enters into the heart. This Noor or light uh, is not sold in the stock market. kept only from Allah. We have a very serious gathering here tonight for the chairman. <laughs> Are they usually so serious at universities? <laughs> uh, <laughs> And then came the second sign, which is far more difficult to recognize. That the slave woman will give birth to her mistress. That is around the corner. But one has to, the subject of Akhir Zaman, or the last age, or the end time, to be able to understand the slave woman giving birth to her mistress. 
riba. Said the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, whether it be large or small, eventually results in poverty and destitution. Indonesia is poor today and that didn't happen by accident. Bangladesh is miserably poor today and that didn't happen by accident. Yemen is poor and Egypt is poor. And if you believe that happened by accident, you should go and build a house on the moon. Yeah. They are poor today because of riba. Sometimes the money lender lends on interest in order to ensure that he remains permanently rich because he immunizes himself from loss by lending on interest. And when an economy is based on money being lent on interest, then wealth no longer circulates through the economy. And the rich remain permanently rich, and the poor are imprisoned in permanent poverty. And that, of course, is oppression. But there's another form of riba. If you meet a man coming to the market to sell his goods, a truckload of durian, D24 is called it, top quality, and you buy his durians from him, before he could enter the market, the wholesale price was 20 cents a kilo, top quality. And you bought it from him for 15. And when he entered the market, he found that he could have gotten a better price. The Prophet said, this is riba. You've exploited his ignorance of the market price to extract a gain or a profit greater than that to which you are justly entitled. That's the elegant way of expressing it, explaining it. The Americans have a nice way to say the same thing. You, say, you ripped him off. That's riba. The biggest riba, the biggest rip-off of all which has helped to contribute substantially to the abject poverty of most of the world of Islam today. Miserable poverty. Biting poverty. Such poverty that our daughters are now working in Singapore as domestic servants for the enemies of Islam for $300 a month. And no Singaporean girl, of course, will ever work for that salary of a dog. So much for the great democracy of Singapore. It's because of riba that the Indonesian women are now working like dogs for the slave, slave wages because of riba. Uh, I think there's not much difference in, in Malaysia where they work for about 400 ringgits or eight, 600 ringgits. And no Malaysian woman will work for that wage and do that work. That's oppression. And so riba results in people being embraced in a new slavery. That slavery has come to it. But the last age also witnesses something called a feminist revolution. Which says to women that all through history you've been oppressed, particularly by men, oppressed by religion. That we're going to put an equal sign between the male and the female. Islam never put an equal sign between the male and the female. Islam said something far more beautiful than that nonsense. Islam said that the male and the female are like two halves, eternally longing for each other. And when they come together, they make a whole. So it's not equality, you dum-dum. It's compliment. 
It's not equality, you dumb dumb, it's complementarity. That they complement each other. Huh? The one without the other is incomplete. But along comes this modern feminist revolution which says anything that a man does, a woman must have the freedom to do it. But Allah created the male and the female the way that He created the night and the day. He says so in Surah al -Layn. Look at the night and look at the day and you see the male and the female. The day must perform his job and the night must perform her job. They are functionally different. And when they perform their basic functions then the machine can work. The system will be harmonious. Makes sense. But when the night wants to become day, uh, in Singapore the night is already day. In Malaysia the night is making significant progress to become day. In Indonesia the night is struggling. <laughs> struggling. Oh, an awkward struggle to become day. Have you ever seen an Indonesian woman dressed as a policewoman? <laughs> <laughs> what a cumbersome sight she looks like. <laughs> when the night attempts to become day, the feminist revolution deprives her of her femininity. She's no longer truly a woman. She acquires so many masculine qualities that some men are turned off. But it's not only the loss of femininity, it's also the loss of fertility. Wherever the feminist revolution has made progress, you also have to have fertility clinics now <laughs> because the womb refuses to function. And so what does she do? Because if she cannot give a child to her husband, he gonna get someone else. So it's a very Serious matter here. If this marriage is to survive, we need to have children. The man wants a child of his own sperm. So, so, you look for the slave woman. Uh, in the United States, she'll charge you about 70,000 US. But you can find a slave woman in India or Bangladesh. And you can only pay her maybe 7,000. And her, her womb will now become a factory, rent a womb. And when the baby is born, if it's a baby boy, well, it's just another child. But if it's a baby girl, she's going to rule her mother. I wonder why. I'll tell you why. Because the prophet said about the last age, not only that a slave woman will give birth to her mistress, but that one man would have to maintain 50 women, indicating that there will be a calamitous decline in the birth of baby boys. I wonder why. Does the cell phone have anything to do with it, the radiation? Does the laptop computer have anything to do with it, the radiation? Does genetically modified food have anything to do with it? That sperm production in the male is now significantly damaged to such an extent that the male chromosome becomes too weak to fertilize the female egg. And so as a result of that, only baby girls are being born. Once in a blue moon you get a baby boy. And in a world of one man and one woman, one vote, you're familiar with that, women are going to rule the world. So she, she gives birth to a baby girl and the baby girl will become her mistress. So the second sign was a little bit more complicated. 
the, the first. But why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send Jibra'il alayhi salam at the very last stage of the life of the Prophet alayhi salatu and in this dramatic way other than to deliver a message of supreme importance that Akhiru Zaman is not just another subject in the curriculum but rather that Akhiru Zaman of the last age is a subject of supreme strategic importance. You cannot understand the world today. You cannot understand international politics. The passage, for example, <coughs> for Pax Britannica. <coughs> you, you've all seen Jerusalem in the Quran. It's been here around 10 years now. The three circles, Pax Britannica, when Britain ruled the world, to Pax Americana, which has been the ruling state now for the last half a century or more. And now the passage to Pax Judaica, when Israel takes control of the world. You cannot understand international politics without this subject of Akhir zaman In uh, academic circles it's called eschatology. It's not a branch of medicine. No. Eschatology. Eschatology. Eschatology is that subject in which you study Akhir zaman the last age. So the Christians have their eschatology. And the Jews have their eschatology. And so do the Hindus and the Buddhists. We have our eschatology. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can get a, uh, um, onto YouTube and look for my lecture on Islam and the end of history. And in that lecture I have given some indication of their differing views on the end of history. One cannot understand international economics today. One cannot understand international monetary economics. The movement from the sterling, first of all, the disappearance of the gold dinar and silver dirham from the market. It didn't happen by accident. If you believe that the gold dinar and silver dirham disappeared from the market by accident, you should go and build a house on the moon. It didn't happen by accident. It happened by design. And then the emergence of paper currencies, first of all with the sterling pound as the international currency, and then came the US dollar. And we are now located at that moment in time when the US dollar, I don't know if you heard it, is in the ICU, intensive care unit of the hospital, <laughs> about to expire. <laughs> And it's not expiring through natural causes. They are destroying it. It is a planned demolition of the US dollar. So that a new monetary system can emerge to replace the existing one. It's not happening by accident. And that new monetary system will help to propel Israel be the next ruling state in the world. You cannot understand this subject without Akhir zaman without the study of the end time. We are living in a world in today in which mankind is all coming together as one global society. Everybody living the same way, driving the same Toyota Camry <laughs> with the same hypertension, the same prostate, the same breast cancer, the same everything. And dressing the same way, I call them the blue jeans, Jamaat, you know that. <laughs> Is this happening by accident? The emergence for the first time in human history of one global society? No. 
If you believe this is by accident, you got the intellectual acumen of a donkey. <laughs> no, this is not happening by accident. But you cannot understand globalization, even if you're Prime Minister of Malaysia, forget it. You cannot understand the reality of globalization unless and until you go to the subject of eschatology. And when you do that, then you know what tomorrow holds in store. So now let's go to the Quran. Let's go to the Quran. And let me give you a taste. Just a taste. Of what is there in the Quran. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Fussilat, Ba'arawuz billahi min ash-shaytani wajim. Sanurihim ayatina fil afaq wa fi anfusihim hatta yatabayyana lahum annahu al-haq that the Quran has a magnificent role left to play in history a glorious role left to play in history the Quran that the ayat of Allah, the signs of Allah, will be unfolding in the historical process. Particularly in the last days. And as the signs of Allah unfold in the historical process, as the signs of Allah unfold in the historical process, they would validate the claim to truth in the Quran that this is the truth and so the Quran does not belong to the museums of history and all the knowledge that the Quran has come to deliver the world to the world has not been has not been exhausted no so if you believe that only the tafasir give you the knowledge of the Quran. Only the Tafasir. And you're wrong. The Quran says something else that is very dramatic. And if you've not had your dinners yet, I'd suggest skip dinner. Because after listening to this, your food will not digest. The religion of Islam has zero tolerance for oppression, among other things. And every oppressor in history has been destroyed by Allah. And the Quran is replete of evidence of the destruction of previous people because of oppression. One form of oppression is, of course, economic oppression. Paying slave wages. China today rules the market, doesn't it? Not by accident, by design. China is where China is today because of slave wages. Slave wages. Today, all around the world, the economy is one in which wealth no longer circulates. And the rich are now permanently rich around the world and the poor are now in miserable poverty, imprisoned permanently. So around the world today there is oppression. And around the world there is the movement towards biting, biting uh, poverty and destitution as the value of this bogus and fraudulent an utterly haram paper money come collapses, goes down and down and down. So it should not be difficult for us to understand or to anticipate that Allah's destruction is coming. You can't get away from it. In Surah Al Isra, he said it. This is a one of the events of the Akhir Zaman. Wa'im min qariyatin. Wa'im min qariyatin illa 
نحن مهلكوها قبل يوم القيامة أو معذبوها عذابا شديدا كان ذلك في الكتاب مستورا This is something inscribed in the book that not a single town or city will escape but we will destroy them all and those that escape destruction including Kuala Lumpur would be punished with terrible punishment. So what about those of us who worship Allah? And there are so many in this room here tonight. That's why you are here to listen to the lecture, because of your love for your religion. What about those who are always performing their salat, fasting in Ramadan, giving in charity, what's going to be their state? Allah answered that as well. A very famous hadith al-Qudsi, in which he sent Jibra'il alayhislam to destroy a town. One of the reasons for destruction is oppression. And then Jibra'il alayhislam pointed out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but in that town there is this servant of yours, who is constantly in ibadah. What shall we do with him? What shall we do with him? And Allah says, destroy him and destroy the town. Meaning, that you, you and I must have zero tolerance for oppression. And zero tolerance for oppression means that you must first respond to oppression by attempting to change it with your hand. And if you cannot, then with your tongue. And if you cannot, then with your heart and get out. Don't say that. Because Allah is going to destroy that town. And if you remain there, you will be destroyed with them. My opinion after writing this book, An Islamic View of Gog and Magog in the Modern World, is that that moment of destruction where all the cities and towns of the world are going to be destroyed and uh, only very few of mankind will survive. My understanding is it's going to come in the clash between Gog and Magog. But nobody knows the subject of Gog and Magog. Nobody knows the subject. Nobody teaches the subject. And much of the literature that we have is worthy of Disneyland. <laughs> so I have attempted in this book to approach the subject in a scholarly way. And I came to the conclusion that there is, the, the Quran is prophesying a clash between Gog and Magog. I have identified the Magog of the Quran with Russia today and the allies of Russia. And I've identified the Gog of the Quran with the Anglo-American-Israeli alliance which has NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And these two are going to clash. But whenever I give my opinion, i will be terribly disappointed if you accept it un uncritically. Terribly disappointed. I never treated... I never had that relationship with my teacher and I hope you would not have that relationship with me. If I give an opinion, I want you to study it critically and accept it only when you are convinced that it is correct. Otherwise you are disrespecting your own intellect. And so I have identified the Magog of the Quran with Russia and its allies. And China is going to be an ally of Russia. And have identified the Gog of the Quran with the Anglo-American Israeli alliance, with NATO. And that these two are going to clash. But you don't need a Quran. You just have to look at the chessboard and you see that they are zealously encircling Russia with nuclear missiles. And the Russian leader is not a fool, <laughs> Putin. 
He's waiting for that. They're doing it because they want to rule the world. So that Israel can rule the world. So the whole world must bend down. So that the man will stand up in Israel tomorrow and declare, I am the Messiah. Now you and I know he's, he's going to be the John, the false Messiah. But Russia is not going to bend down and submit to Israel. No. And China is not going to do it. The Chinese are very proud of their civilization and they have every right to be. The Chinese in Singapore, don't bother about them. <laughs> don't bother about them. But China is very proud of its civilization. China will not bend its knee. So, you can see the script, we're moving towards that clash, which is going to be a nuclear clash, with thousands of nuclear weapons being used. And this is one of the ten major signs that were given, the Dukhan of smoke. I believe that is going to be the time when all the cities and all the towns are going to be destroyed. And the radiation that now embraces us all with the cellular phones and so on is going to play a role in reducing all, us, all of us to fried eggs. How long from now? My guess, and I can be wrong, we don't have more than about 20, 25 years left before there'll be a substantial reduction in the number of human beings on the face of the earth. Who will survive? Those who get out of that society of oppression. Can be saved. Once you are within the money system, you are part of the system. And the money system tomorrow is not going to be like a money system today. Today's money system still has a chance for anonymous transactions. You want to buy roti chai? <laughs> you could take out your wallet, give two ringgit, get your roti chai. Nobody knows. Government doesn't know you did. You could buy tetaric. Just take out your wallet, put a ringgit, two ringgit. Nobody knows you bought it, Eric. But I think that the paper money is on its way out now. Oh